My name is Brian Durrance. I'm with Mission. Caleb Poyer is also with Mission, and so is Tate Williams. We're all from Mission. And we are also, oh, Charles, Charles, here, you need to be up here on the platform, on the, on the dais. <laughs> here you go. This is Charles Ciccarelli. Charles is responsible for most of the artwork that you're going to see here, and he's going to do a special presentation just on that piece when we get to that point. So what I've been asked to do is this. I'm going to turn it over to Caleb, and he's going to do the, uh, the introduction to our, our workshop, but I need to give the instructions. When you all ask questions, I have to literally hand this microphone over to you and you speak into it. You won't hear yourself on the PA, but you have to do it so that we can get it onto the thing. So it's gonna be a little awkward, but it'll be all worth it when this uh, documentary comes out. So with, uh, without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna hand this over to Caleb Poyer, who is the founder of our tent community that started over on our, behind our land in, I think about 2008. And, um, and then we're gonna go from there. All right, take it away. Sure, Brian. Actually, I'm pr always impressed when you do the um, the uh, emceeing, and I'm kind of think that you should do more of that. So I'm going to be uh, pushing the microphone your direction more frequently. For those of you guys um, who are new to this, we're going to do uh, just a, a brief backstory. Um, Peggy, w will you sit with us just because we'll have you talk at different points? Um, so this is uh, a little community of homeless folks, and uh, we've been a community of homeless folks for about eight years. Um, we started off in tents right here in Ann Arbor, and uh, we've been evicted uh, from our tents from uh, six different places around Ann Arbor. Um, and ultimately, uh, we coalesced into a nonprofit. And that nonprofit was gifted uh, with an, by an anonymous donor with um, money to purchase land. Um, and so now we own three acres. So the majority of our talk today, hopefully, is going to focus on what we're going to do with those three acres. Um, but it's <laughs> so good to see you. Um, it, I would like to uh, just give those who are a part of our earlier community, just to give context for where we are now, uh, a moment to talk about uh, what, the, what the tent city looked like uh, when we had it here in Ann Arbor. Now, it may not be that unique, uh, but I think the unique thing, I mean, to your eyes, uh, tent city, um, but I think what's different is that uh, gatherings of homeless folks can be organized or uh, they can be just um, ad hoc. And the ad hoc organizations of homeless folks often is a little bit um, unwieldy. Um, so when you get an organized group of homeless folks, that's kind of a rare unicorn. Um, you don't see that very frequently across the United States. And uh, Tate, who's been with us uh, from the very beginning. I'm just hoping that you would tell us a little bit more about that tent city and the, perhaps uh, the pieces of it that you hope to bring over to our tiny house community slash uh, home for uh, tent folks. Hello everyone, I'm Tate. I think the thing you'll hear us talk about the most, uh, be it the future tiny house community or, or a tent community is the word camaraderie, uh, bringing people together. I've always called it the beaten dog syndrome where when a dog attempts something and they get smacked on the nose enough, eventually they stop asking. Well, that's what happens with people when they get isolated with, within tents. Uh, they tend to withdraw from society as opposed to contributing to it. One of the things, one of the aspects that a tent community provides is immediate access to a shelter within a community on a low-cost basis where we can start getting people to withdraw or, or uh, get out of that withdrawal from themselves and start functioning back within a societal group where they realize it's not a fend for yourself. It's a bring everybody together for the common good of society. Get used to, um, we call them rules, but eventually they have to, to get used to societal laws again. Um, other aspects of it all pretty much tie in there together. By bringing people together, you bring safety in numbers. Um, Peggy had said earlier about it's very difficult to go out on the street and 
listen to people say get a job when when you walk in the office to interview you have to ask where to put your sleeping bag um, this provides a, a communal space that gives you your own private section within there to feel safe and to be able to feel like you we call it a home because it is a home um, there's many more aspects. I don't want to take up too much time because we're here for a different subject. Uh, but th there's more aspects even on taxpayer. People say, well, you're using my taxpayer money. Well, by grouping people together, we can actually save the counties and the agencies money in their gas and their labor going out to find 70 different individuals under bridges when we have all 70 of them right there for them to talk to at one time. Um, you'll see how this immediate need for what are you going to do tonight if you have nowhere to sleep tonight is a very very immediate need yes there's services that are out there but they're not readily accessible tonight so by using that concept we can progress people into a more stable housed type community in the tiny house function which you'll you'll hear a lot more about i'm not going to start on it um but i hope you can see where the immediate need can be transgressed into a more economical solution so that people can then transgress or, or tran transpose into regular societal apartment or house living Thanks. Th hey, thank you. It's it's a little bit odd speaking into the microphone without the reverb. It it feels like you're playing uh, playing announcer. Um, so uh, what we're skipping past here is kind of the history of mission, which has its own uh, exciting dramas, and I'm excited, uh, of course, to tell you about that perhaps after the meeting. Um, I, I wanted to uh, talk for just a, a moment about the different groups of folks that have come out of uh, this, this, these tent cities. Um, just a little more about what they, um, kind of the broad uh, boundaries of personality or grouping that they m would fall into. And uh, we, we have currently two different houses where we do hospitality with the homeless. One of them is on Stone School and one of them is on Huron. And uh, these different places have brought together different uh, groups of folks. And uh, it is from these different groups of people that we hope to build the future tiny house community with. Um, and, and so so that we're not just referring to the homeless in a in a super generic form um, and without spending too much time on it. Uh, Brian, I was hoping you would talk just briefly about the communities we serve uh, in the different categories. And then Peggy, I was hoping you would talk a little bit about the community that gathers at your house. <laughs> All right, so as you all know, we ran a tent city out there on Wagner Road. Now that, uh, that idea evolved um, out, of a, out of something Caleb did. He brought in from Seattle the concept that he just described, which is an organized tents community. That doesn't mean that he brought homelessness with him. Um, I went to community high school back in the 1970s, and I remember uh, quite a few homeless people that I would encounter daily in the downtown area back then. And that, by the way, was before Ronald Reagan was president. A lot of people say Ronald Reagan closed the mental institutions, and then all of a sudden there they were. That isn't true. Those people were out. Homeless people have always been attracted to university environments, and that's been through back. I've talked to people who said that there were homeless people back in the 60s. But what we did not have um, until... Uh, mission came along was uh, was a politically organized homeless community um, the closest we had was uh, a community that w uh, became Avalon housing and uh, those people occupied the site where the county records building was and that evolved into Avalon housing which is an amazing organization which is doing something that we're going to be in a sense in harmony with hopefully and we'll be talking more about that in a minute i'm very excited about what avalon housing does because what it does is it takes people who 
uh, might qualify for housing but are not able to stay into housing, stay in or hold their leases, complete their leases for a number of important reasons. Um, and uh, those are the people that we also want to help here. Now, we started by helping people who lived in tents, um, uh, who, who were people that had lived in tents. Now, when, that, when we had to close that camp, um, uh, you know, I, I think it was around 2010, because MDOT um, said it, it was getting too large. We, we had actually up to about 65 people there uh, when it finally closed. Um, the community disbanded, and we were dispersed out into the desert. And what happened was really amazing. A lot of people thought we would lose our community, but instead we began to coalesce around uh, the living room that Peggy graciously opened up over in the Burns Park area. And the community continued to survive. We had our Sunday meals that uh, uh, we talked about at the last workshop, and that continues today. And what we learned um, was that there there are other homeless communities that we were not necessarily serving when we were at the camp. There's people who are precariously housed, couch servers, you might call them, people who are in and out of housing for a variety of reasons. There's also people who are housed, but don't necessarily have enough money to do laundry and that kind of stuff. And then there's a, a new group which has uh, coalesced around the, the, the house we now call Hill House, after our former president, Jimmy Hill, uh, on 350, uh, 3501 Stone School Road. This is the motor homeless community. These are people living in their vans, their cars, their trucks, and um, they, I'm told they're called rubber tramps. I like to call them in some ways, you know, like mobile hermits in a way, because these people are self-sufficient, but they're not necessarily the people who would gravitate into a tight community that requires a lot of interaction. So each of these different communities, including the people who are in Avalon Housing and other organizations like Avalon Housing that provide housing, such as three-quarter houses for people recovering from alcoholism and drug addictions, all these people are attracted to the community that is housed at on Stone School Road and also the uh, the Mercy House on on um, Huron. Thank you. All right. Our dream when we bought this house was to rebuild the tent city that we had there. And we quickly learned as homeowners that it's more complicated than that. As homeowners, you have to be responsible, legally responsible to your neighbors. And when you start to work directly with the city government, uh, that things change as well. A lot of people don't realize that when we were on Wagner Road, we were one inch to the west of the, the western edge of the city property. So we were actually in Sio Township. So we had a very unique relationship with both the city and the township at that point. Now we're solidly within the city. We are taxpaying citizens. And um, so we have gone, we're going through a process where we're going to work through all of the, we're going to, we're going to go through and we'll work with the city officials at all levels to, till we get to where we need to go. But that was the, the purpose of this part was just to describe the, the four or five different communities that we're now serving. Each one of them has its own character, its own flavor, each one has its own needs. So what we have to build is something that's not a tent city. Um, but something that accommodates the needs of all the people that we now serve, and that's going to be the challenge. So I'm going to pass it back to Caleb, and we'll go from there. Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, just for those of you who have questions, we'll, we'll get there in just a moment. Um, and Brian, you did an excellent job of wrapping up uh, some of the communities that we serve right at, here, um, at Stone School. And Peggy, I was just hoping you would talk a little bit about the folks that come uh, to your place and, and how that's uh, its own unique uh, community. Um, so Mercy House is at 805 West Huron. You're all welcome to visit. Um, Mercy House is a house of hospitality in the tradition of my personal hero, Dorothy Day. Um, it's in the tradition of Catholic worker houses, although we don't claim the name because we're um, much broader than that. Um, the um, the two houses of hospitality grew out of the eviction of um, the uh, Camp Take Notice community on Wagner Road. It it took me years to realize the power of the, um, in the Christian tradition, the power of the dying seed. I, I just sobbed when Camp Take Notice was evicted because such beautiful things were happening there. But out of it grew some 
amazingly beautiful things. So for example, at Camp Take Notice, um, every Sunday we had a meal where all of us would gather, and that was a really unique setting where people from all social classes could get together, and I'm not serving you, and you're not less than because I'm serving you. It's we are all as peers, as sisters and brothers, as friends, having a meal together. And that happened every single Sunday. And when we got evicted, um, it was very natural just to simply move that entire um, program, the, the Sunday meals and the Sunday meetings that followed it to my house because it, we had previously been doing Christmas parties there and meetings and, you know, so it wasn't any big thing. It was just, okay, well, we're doing this at my house now. Um, that has been a, a the um, Sunday meal and meeting has always been a very, very powerful experience. It was a powerful experience for me the first time I went down in the woods with tents to hear the traffic buzzing back and forth. And you hear all these people who have such profound issues that they are living in a tent in the woods. And it, it re-inspired my um, love for democracy because all of these broken people and by the way you know I include myself in the group just as broken making what ended up to be very wise compassionate decisions about some really important stuff like who gets to stay here and who doesn't and these were these are wrenching decisions that were made pursuant to the Roberts rules of order in the tent, you know, in this tent community, it was amazing to watch it. And it was amazing to watch the wise and balanced and just outcomes of these decisions and the votes that were required by these Roberts Rules of Order. So it was that event, that meal where we all get together as peers, and then we sort through the really hard shit of life through this method of the Roberts Rules of Order that moved to moved to our house. And now we have two houses, and the houses are really intending to be responsive to the needs on the ground as we perceive them. So it, when, when you live outside, it can be very, very difficult to find a place to wash your clothes. And not being able to take a lawn, uh, to do laundry or take a shower is, let me just tell you, dehumanizing. Because if you smell bad and if your clothes look raggedy, you are not accepted in the society. You are just not. And you are not going to find a job. And you are not going to be allowed to sit at Starbucks for a few hours like the rest of us are allowed to do. You are, you are going to be moved on. Um, so finding a place to take a shower and do laundry, the privacy to do that. And by the way, you know, if, if all of your belongings or you're carrying them on your back, you might not have a set of clothes to change into so that you can wash the ones you're wearing. So we have extra clothes at both houses to allow for that. And just because people in the winter, they need winter coats and socks. I mean, socks are practically, um, uh, you, you need a pair of new pair of socks every time the ones you're wearing get wet. So they're semi-disposable as our sleeping bags. We're going to need them again in the spring because all the winter warming sh shelters, which are life critical in Ann Arbor, are going to be closing down. And all those people that are sleeping at the churches and sleeping on the floor at Delanis are going to be sleeping outside or in their cars. And they're going to need sleeping bags. And that happens every spring. And I can tell you right now, we are going to need dozens and dozens of sleeping bags. So the house on Huron is intentionally very close to the main shelter in town, which is you know really fabulous, beautiful thing. And every Saturday we get together for breakfast. We have a huge breakfast, like 60 people, and we are intentionally, we are welcoming guests to our home. So what that means for us in my Christian t tradition, what I am in my heart doing is welcoming Jesus to my home. And so what that drives an entirely different approach to having folks in your home for breakfast. Things are beautiful. Things are, um, we take a lot of care and um, 
our Zen Buddhist friends are uh, really wonderful because they donate produce that we couldn't otherwise afford. So we have a homemade everything. And Sherry Wander, who's one of my good friends and a co-founder of Mercy House, one of the best cooks I know. And we make a beautiful Sunday or a Saturday breakfast, 10 to 2 every Saturday, where people can also take a shower, do laundry, access used the clothes that are in the basement, a um, sleeping bag if that's what they need. But most of all, uh, creating a sense of community because the sense of community is what um, Camp Take Notice and Mission are all about, and it's acting in solidarity. We, we're, nobody's better than anybody else. We are all working together to try to deal with the systemic injustices of our society. And by the way, in my opinion, homelessness is per se economic injustice, if you see what the effects are in human beings. Um, so that, the other thing that both houses do, we have a small number of people who live there who would otherwise be homeless and help make the wheels turn. And then we allow for um, respite. Uh, so people who are living outside who are having a health crisis or surgery or um, have cancer or you know have a court date tomorrow and they need to look uh, and be presentable or have a job interview we have um, couches available for that type of respite care at both uh, respite stays for um, short-term stays at both houses so is that what you wanted yeah, thank you uh, so I just wanted to build this backdrop backdrop uh, upon which uh, we hope to uh, use this group of people um, and and with uh, uh, kind of together uh, achieve a tiny house community um, and the there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, challenging issues in a tiny house community um, that have to be worked out. And I would say I've been trying to wrap my brain around them for the last year and a half uh, with the rest of uh, the mission board. Um, and so I guess what I wanted to share with you is that uh, as we share our vision of the tiny house community, this is coming with an asterisk. Um, and that, that asterisk is uh, we have big, big dreams. Um, and in what we're getting ready to do is attempt to move those big dreams through the process of uh, city approval. Um, so that's um, that's going to be a, that's the challenge that's ahead of us here, and and likely uh, the reason that we'll be uh, needing your support will be related to uh, gaining approval through the city process. So with that asterisk, um, I would like somebody who has been sketching out um, some uh, beta versions of what our community could be um, uh, to describe uh, some of the uh, slides, which I'll be showing. Um, and uh, uh, this is Charles uh, Sicarelli. Am I saying that correct? Um, and uh, uh, Charles is uh, known in Ann Arbor for drawing um, incredibly detailed pictures of architecture that are sold uh, around town and you can find his work uh, sold uh, even at Briarwood um, so to our great surprise he decided that he was fond of what we were doing and he has been mocking things up we we kind of gesticulate and 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 put words out and um, uh, Charles has been turning them into pictures so uh, Charles I'm gonna hold uh, some of these pictures up um, and then I'm gonna pass them around with the hopes that uh, people can look at them more closely. And you guys will be able to see them as I hold them up here, but uh, it's a little bit too small to appreciate. So I'll just pass it and you guys will be in the constant process of passing these uh, slides around. Um, Charles, go ahead and stand up and I'll start uh, with your conversation about what could be our, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and move those for you if you just wanna be talking with the microphone. Okay. And uh, you can start by talking about these over here. Oh yes, um, one of the things that I oops, <laughs> uh, one of the things that I did was a PowerPoint presentation, and um, um, in fact, I've got it on a flash drive in my pocket, but we don't have any means of showing that. However, there are a number of these uh, uh, pictures that do show up on the on the on the PowerPoint, and so they're they're uh, visible for you to see. Um, um, this first picture right there is the, yes, that one. Uh, that's a site plan that I, I um, 
I used the background photograph, and then I drew in uh, uh, a. This is one one possibility. Was this is the, this by the way is the three acres of of the uh, lot that they're talking about, and this is Stone School Road, and you take a drive right here, and then this is this is it used to be called Mercy House, now it's called Hill House. Correct. Okay. All right. All right. So that's Hill House. And uh, this this assumes that a build bridge is built across here. That hasn't been done yet. There's a small b walk bridge there, but uh, uh, this 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 is a um, um, an automobile or a vehicle vehicle uh, drive. And then uh, I don't know if you can how well you can see this, but there are little cul-de-sacs. There's a total of seven of them, and each cul-de-sac has uh, there are seven uh, cul-de-sacs with seven houses, making a total of 49 houses, which is a kind of a oh, there's a lot of argument as to how many houses there should be. So, I mean, some uh, some thoughts are. <laughs> Mike is just recording. Oh, oh. Well, then I'll speak, I'll speak louder then in that case. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, discussion as to whether uh, there should be, as there are in that drawing, 49 tiny houses or 80 to 100 tiny houses. I have one scheme that shows 90, one scheme that shows 80, but the 49 tiny house uh, um, um, plan takes into account a... Uh, a, a um, local ordinance that if you if you do not build the tiny houses uh, so that they're sort of super fire retardant, that you have to space them ten feet apart, and in that lot that pretty well forced that uh, seven cul-de-sacs of seven houses each. And this also, uh, this concept also assumes that there's going to be a commons building in the middle. Um, these tiny houses are about 10 by 12 feet in uh, um, uh, their, their dimensions. And um, you, you go in, and you have this little room, and there's a ladder that goes to a loft. And that's for where the bed is. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's ideal for housing one person. Um, this is this is one concept of a tiny house. No, no, no. This is I'm sorry. I mean, of a common I'm thinking one thing. Yeah, anyway, this is the uh, uh, um, concept of the commons building, uh, uh, and this shows what is called a kiva. It's a kind of a more or less circular, uh, but this is octagonal in this particular case, a gathering place. Uh, uh, in, in, in this particular design, the fireplace is on one end, so that people are have free free access within that within this kiva. This is the largest single space for uh, dining, for gathering, for meetings, and uh, uh, the. Uh, uh, let me see that once more time. At the, I wanted to create. A, uh, when, uh, when I designed this, I wanted to create a feeling that this was a kind of uh, something rustic or uh, outdoors or something, and uh, so I have the uh, this this uh, roof structure with skylights at the top. Um, in this concept, a, a true kiva would have a chimney in the middle, and there would be a hole in the top, like what was called in Roman times an ocellus. But uh, I worried about the uh, the uh, possibility of weather, birds getting in. But uh, the, the, but this could be uh, something that uh, uh, many people are at home with. But this is a this is a closed unit concept, and yet it still has a kind of a uh, a uh, not a refined look to it. Um, if you want a more refined look, you go through inside here. You can go through into the uh, into the rest of the building. In which case, that, that plan brings us to the plan view. Yes. Okay. okay. Here's the kiva, and you go through here, and this takes you into the. the there's a big kitchen here in the center, and uh, bathrooms. There are uh, in this particular design. There are four showers, and four baths, and. Um, uh, two sinks uh, and uh, heating units so that when uh, people who live in these little tiny houses will not have toilets. They want to, um, yeah, uh, one of the concepts, and you'll see that with, with these drawings, is that in the middle of the cul-de-sac is a little 
uh, bathroom house, which you could call an outhouse if you wanted to, but uh, this is, it's controversial as to whether that should be there. However, if it were, if each cul-de-sac had one of those, it would be, it would be quite convenient for seven people. But if, if that is not uh, uh, generally desired, they can always go to the Commons building uh, uh, for, for their bathroom facilities. Um, this particular um, um, Commons house is rather ambitious in that in the, 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 the Akiva is a stone uh, structure, and it's actually 17 feet high. And then the rest of the, uh, the building, which is used for uh, um, cooking and bath facilities and an office and, uh, is, is a uh, frame construction, but it's attached to it, so it's all one building. That's one possibility. Another possibility would be to have just a frame construction and not have a kiva. I think the kiva is, uh, could be considerably more expensive, but uh, this is in the concept stage now, so that there's uh, there are various uh, alternatives as to what can be done. The uh, other thing that I, uh, in the PowerPoint presentation that, uh, uh, no, the one on the right, that one, yeah. That shows uh, four of the uh, tiny house communities throughout the United States. There's one in, uh, well, there they are there. <laughs> uh, um, and so a precedent has been set for doing this. This is not something new. This is not, this is something that has been done uh, in, in Olympia, Eugene, Portland, and uh, also in Austin, Texas. Um, um, and showing this, I would think, would somehow lower the resistance to doing this because uh, in, there are places all over the United States where it works. And people have tiny houses and they're, uh, they're happy with it. So. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to think if there's anything. Uh, I think that more or less there's this one last one. There is a lot more. But there's a lot more. That, <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, we have to move on to the next piece. Um, so that we uh, we have somebody on our team who is excellent at uh, sewing together the details of the picture, which is uh, a nice counterbalance to people uh, like uh, perhaps myself and Brian who, who build things in cloud. So you need to have somebody else who also builds things uh, on the ground. Um, so uh, I wanted to continue to bring you up to speed a little bit more. Um, a lot of folks want to know, well, have you gone fundraising for this yet? And we would like to, but it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem because you can, you could ask for money, but it's difficult to uh, acquire that money if the donor is um, not confident that you have permission from the city to build what you want to build. Um, so, it, it, what the, the 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 first thing we must do is acquire permission from the city, and uh, fortunately, we've got uh, the the most excellent team that I could uh, ask for. The it was the mayor himself who asked uh, one of his uh, real estate lawyer friends to uh, work with us uh, on this committee, um, and. Uh, so we've got him, and we also have uh, a fellow whose specialty is moving this through the city process. Um, and the two of them are taking our ideas and um, pushing them through the process. And so uh, although the process is not exciting, it is the piece where we need your help at the moment. Um, and Brian, I was hoping that you would tell us just a little bit about the permissions that we have to acquire to make this happen. All right, this is where it gets fun. Um, so has anybody here had any experience like doing development work in the city of Ann Arbor? Well, you know, you know from reading the newspapers, it's quite a challenge, of course. And so one of the things that Caleb says, um, we've been asked by our experts to narrow it down 
and simplify it so that it can be presented to the city in a way that they can understand. Now we've done a lot of background work. We have been working with uh, uh, people on the staff on the city government uh, who have been very, very helpful in offering their suggestions about what it should and most importantly what it should not be. Um, We've also talked to rep and uh, city council representatives. This, you know, we're 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 communicating with the city attorney and the planning department. This all is is a part of a process that uh, has been designated to our uh, organization's PUD committee, which stands for Planned Urban or Planned Unit Development. I'm very sorry, um, which is essentially is a a very elaborate variance to city zoning organization or city zoning codes. There, of course, is no. Um, there is no zoning for such a thing as a tiny house. Um, it violates all of the all of the organizations. But what there is is something that allows for something they call an AUD, um, accessory or accessory dwelling ADU. I'm sorry. And so I'm holding this up to describe what we're really essentially talking about. These are 10 by 12, and they are like the size of a tool shed. But they're a little bit more tricked out. Um, they can look like little, um, just pass this around, they can look like little Victorian houses, or they could look like this unit that was created by the University of Michigan for us uh, last summer. This one's a little bit more Swedish modern. It's, it's very hip. I'll start this one over here. Um, and this is the interior design. It has everything you might need, including a loft space. It's heated. This one uh, gets all of his electricity from a small solar panel, and Tate Williams has been using that solar panel this winter to light his tent, power his cell phone, and even run a laptop, and he's able actually to watch uh, Netflix movies, uh, I'm told. <laughs> So it's amazing what you can do with small things. So I'll pass this in around two. Let's start this one here in the middle there. Um, so this is what we have decided on as a group. We have said that we are going to approach the, um, the help me out, the, uh, the Building Board of Appeals. All right. With a very simple concept, a community that looks like this. And I don't know, did we talk about the number of units? Uh, Charles did. Okay, do you remember the number we have requested? Uh, 80. Okay, so we have re we've started with a simple request for 80 units. Uh, this one shows for it. If this hasn't already been passed around, I'll pass that around as well. And we're hoping to get their response back. All right, so ask right now we're asking for uh, units that have no electricity, that sit on concrete slabs, but are not uh, permanently affixed. They're not on wheels. They're not heated except for uh, small propane heaters similar to the ones that you'd find in actual tents. And the electricity will come from solar power. For the time being, we're simply asking to see if uh, how the Building Board of Appeals will react to that. And their only interest, I'm told, is whether or not it meets city building codes. If we get past that, then we go to the Zoning Board of Appeals, and that's when we talk about the really interesting stuff, like whether or not they'll allow us to put in uh, buildings that don't have bathrooms, whether, the, whether they're going to be required to have sewers, whether they're going to be required to have... Where's, where's Charles's... Um, I don't know if you noticed this cool thing about Charles Community Center building. It's set up on stilts over a pond. The reason he did that was because we were told that we might be required to put a retaining pond in, as you see in, in a lot of businesses now with cattails and reeds and things like that. And so we, draw, we drew it that way. It's inspired by the library, the, the, uh, the branch library up behind the Target over there um, on, the, on that end of town. Brilliant. Charles, gang, <laughs> absolutely brilliant. So anyway, um, we have. There's a lot we can say about this, but we're we're waiting, we're waiting for the response from the city. That's the first step, and then we we have a series of steps that'll follow. And what I'd like to do is save all those other details for the question and answer period because I know you're going to have lots, and I see we have some experts in the room here, which we might be able to uh, get some answers from as well. Um, all right, so I'm going to pass this back to Caleb, and we'll go from there. Sure. So I think we'll we'll carve out maybe uh, three minutes at the end to 
briefly talk about uh, some ways to plug in, but I'd like to jump right to questions right now for those of you that have them. Yeah, go for it. And I'm gonna give you the microphone. Where should I, should I? Oh, you can okay, that okay. <laughs> so children. Are we assuming no children would be living with these families? And 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 the second question is, when you're talking about needing um, sleeping bags, how do people help with that? Uh, so the sleeping bags is is a wonderful uh, question because we uh, that that tends to be the mainstay of the good deed deed that we do regularly, which is help folks get warm when they're sleeping, um, and those can be taken either to. 3501 Stone School Road or to 805 West Huron. Um, and I'm, I'm pointing at Peggy because uh, 805 is her house. So either of those two locations and uh, we just, uh, we, we'll uh, make sure they get to the right homeless folks from there. So uh, right now the answer is no kids. Um, there are there have been uh, ten communities that have formed and allowed kids um, in Seattle, um, but it's it's uh, it's not common. Um, yes, there's definitely a need for families, uh, space for families, and we're uh, would like to see more uh, complete and thorough accommodation if you're a, a family member. So uh, there's. Definitely here in Ann Arbor, some excellent ways to uh, plug into helping uh, fund and um, support the, the family end of things. Uh, typically, our group is our single folks without, um, without friendships and families. And, and one of the reasons I'm fond of this, this odd structure where you have tiny houses close to each other and a community building where the kitchen is, is because the greatest poverty um, I, in my opinion, is not so much that of uh, money, but it's that of relationships. And I fell in love with democratic uh, self-managed tent communities because of that um, accidental uh, dynamic of, of meeting folks that are uh, turn out to be your friends and feel fill in the quasi uh, sister quasi brother um, you know my my caring uh, you know stepmom and so that is uh, something that's one of the reasons that's one of the things we're attempting to uh, deal with is a lot of times a, a homeless person will move into a uh, an apartment but they won't connect to people to either side of them and we're hoping to create an environment where those connections are frequent and inevitable uh, go ahead with another hand if we, yes please bob yeah i see from your drawing that on one side of the mallet creek looks like a, a floodplain and I know that the city has also done a lot of work along Stone School Road and the bridge over there by near Ellsworth. I wonder what effect that work and the floodplain would have on your planned development. I am so glad you asked the question about the floodplain. All right, now, do we have one of those drawings? Okay, um, let's hold that one up, Will. All right. Yes, hold them both. No, 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 that one right there. Nick, that's the one. All right, now if you'll notice, um, let's hold them both up the same way. So the houses are on the right. Okay, now if you'll notice in this drawing, I guess they're the same actually, you'll notice the, the blue area is the floodplain. We actually paid an engineering firm. It's the same firm that the, uh, the city used when they were doing the engineering work for the Stone School renovation, Stone School Road renovations. They're really great guys. They came out and scouted this out. The area on the east side of the creek, which is where the houses are, um, is above the floodplain. Pretty much the rest of the yard is in the floodplain, um, which means that we're going to have to make some mod. We're going to have to, when we, if we were to put a bridge across, we'd have to w work through several different levels of government, including the DEQ. You've all heard of the DEQ from Flint, the same DEQ. Um, so we'll be working with a lot of different people as we make these decisions. But we absolutely know that this area here is above the floodplain. So we're about two minutes from closing, and uh, we've got two hands, um, and I'm going to ask you to go, because I saw your hand first. Go ahead. 
Just a question about physical accessibility. Notice all the lofts are upstairs. As we become older and physically infirm, what are we dealing with that? I agree with you. I, uh, that's something we haven't uh, drawn into our program yet, but I hope that we do uh, before it's over, which is um, a good percentage of the units handicap accessible. Um, thank you for bringing that up. And Ron, Greg, would you speak mm -hmm. to us for a moment? So we've almost reached the uh, end of this session. Um, I hope you have some specific uh, asks for people and some contact information. I would also say that if anyone here is interested, what, what we really need is public participation during a process that is trying to get waivers from rules and regulations at various levels in the city. So if any of you are interested in advocacy, um, you can contact Mission, but also you can contact ICPJ, which is involved with this. And um, uh, I don't know where the, there's printed contact information. Is there? It's on the back. Uh, uh, email is on the back. Mm -hmm. You're uh, the boards, the entire boards. Okay. That, that'll go out to all of us. Okay. So, so. I, I didn't place it on there. Would you like yours? Yeah, all right. Okay. We. Uh, yeah. We'll so, if you're interested, please be proactive and get in touch with Mission or ICPJ, and um, because we need lots of person power to get this thing through. And so uh, as we're officially in the in-between period here, as we close, you feel free to walk up and have conversations with any of us uh, afterward. Um, there is an opportunity to do some advocacy this Wednesday, and I don't have time to break it out, but if you're interested, uh, Wednesday evening and talking about how to do uh, advocacy for tiny house structures uh, in Ann Arbor, not on our land, but uh, in the form of uh, an ADU, come and talk to me. Um, with that, I think we're gonna... Go ahead. Uh, I just have an announcement about change in workshop locations. So during the six o'clock workshop session, the water justice will move to classroom three and stories from a prison classroom will move to the sanctuary. And that will be posted in other locations as well. Right on. Thank you guys.